Okay, folks, part three in just a little bit more. Um, I don't want to um, just go over every little step of these life cycles. Go ahead and take a look at them. Look at the different stages. Um, notice that there is, um, you know, some of the stages are different in different cycles, different hosts. Um, the difference between the circaria and the metacircarial cyst uh, when you're looking at that in lab so it doesn't get uh, confusing. Um, and on the next uh, slide here is just a um, the CDC, Center for Disease Control's version of the sheep liver fluke. <laughs> um, just to just to give you an alternate presentation of it. And again, you can see in the snail, they're showing the ace, the rapid asexual reproduction, which is the sporocyst teridia to cercaria. And again, remember the ecological and evolutionary context here. You're a parasite. Um, you need to find your way not just to one intermediate host, but to maybe two intermediate hosts, <laughs> and then to a definitive host. So putting out lots of um, pieces, lots of parts of the organism that need to go off and find a host is definitely key. And so having these rapid asexual reproductive modes um, is, is that, that kind of adaptation. And of course, there's the, um, the ones that can swim in the environment, the ones that are uh, stuck in the host. Are they embedded in tissue? Are they swimming through the bloodstream? Um, all those different things. So this this is the um, liver fluke. Um, and then, so let's talk about schistosomiasis a little bit. Now, suddenly um, we're talking about flatworms and we look at this picture of schistosomes and we think, well, they don't look flat, they look kind of round. So there's this sort of uh, secondary uh, rounding <laughs> look here. Uh, but in fact, they are platyhelminths, they are flatworms. The male uh, so there's two worms here. There's a female which is situated within the groove of the body of the male. And so the male is the larger one along the bottom here. And so he's definitely a flatworm, but if you picture a flatworm curved up to make kind of a groove on the ventral side, that's pretty much, pretty much what the male looks like. And then the female is a little bit more rounded and she is almost always, uh, once maturation is reached, located just fixed right within the groove of the male. So obviously these guys are dioecious instead of monoecious and that um, being situated so close to each other makes um, fertilization pretty easy. Here's another uh, photograph of some schistosomes, the male being the larger worm, the flat worm kind of curved to make a groove and then again, the female being this smaller, round-looking worm, although still it's just a, still a platyhelminth situated right inside the, the groove there. And otherwise, just assumes have um, life cycles that, in fact, are in some ways a little less complicated because there's one intermediate host instead of two. So there's just a snail. There's no fish intermediate or crab intermediate. Um, when... Um, the adults are within the body of a human. What happens is um, these guys are also known as blood flukes, so they do live within the in, uh, in the circulatory system. They swim around in arms and I mean um, veins and arteries uh, of um, human beings. Um, and they eventually find their way from the blood vessels surrounding the intestine and um, will uh, shed eggs into the feces like many other parasites. Um, so it's really um, more so than the, than the flukes, the adult worms are right in the circulatory system instead of uh, feeding on the liver within the human. And um, it, it can be quite dramatic. When, years ago when I was... Um, a parasitology teaching assistant as a graduate student back at the University of Cincinnati. This was many years ago. Uh, we had a parasitology lab there, and um, we had um, <coughs> we had rats that were infected with schistosomes, um, and so live rats that were given uh, schistosome worms. Um, we could discuss the ethics of that later, but um, anyway. Uh, what we would do is uh, anesthetize the rat so they were asleep but not dead 
and dissect them and um, take a look at the uh, mesentery between the uh, intestinal uh, part of the intestine, intestinal tract. So there'd be uh, thin tissue layers holding the intestines together. And when you looked at those blood vessels under uh, magnification, you could actually see the worms physically swimming through the veins and arteries. It's an image that's never left me. It's really quite um, tra dramatic. Um, and of course, the, the rats were euthanized after that, in case you were wondering. But it, it's a pretty dramatic sight to see, and obviously huge uh, medical implications from having um, that in, in your body. So, so that was uh, in a rat. These obviously can inf affect humans, and they do in many parts of the world. Many people are infected with this disease. Um, and still uh, a lot of the control has to do with trying to mitigate um, unsanitary conditions, get rid of standing water, try to actually control the growth of the intermediate host to try to eradicate snail populations has been the, the main approach, which is moderately successful. Um, so anyway, um, when the eggs are passed into the feces and hatch out into a myricidium, again, free-living ciliated larval myricidium stage penetrates the snail. Um, and as it says, there's two generations of sporocysts in the snail. So you get the mother and daughter sporocysts that eventually release cercaria. Um, and so some some of these worms will skip the redial stage. Some of them only have one sporocyst stage. Again, there's those complications in here. Uh, so the cercaria um, swims around, again, in a free-living fashion for the most part in, in water and then penetrates the skin. So if you're wading in water that has these cercaria, um, you may even feel it. Um, it can create a rash on the skin. And in fact, you may have heard of swimmer's itch, <laughs> which is um, the cercarial penetration from other um, flukes that may have different definitive hosts. So you may have a fish that's a definitive host, and because these are species specific, the cercaria can actually penetrate your skin and, and get embedded in your skin, but can't develop into a mature worm within your body, thank goodness. So you feel the rash from the cercarial penetration, but you don't ever actually come down with a with the parasitic worm within your body, which, which is a positive thing. So, um, uh, but, but that uh, cercarial penetration is definitely um, noticed. <clears throat> and then um, again, the cercarial will develop into the mature schistosomes um, in the bloodstream of the definitive host, which in this case is a human. So there's no insisting stage um, so there's some differences here between schistosomes and between the other flukes. And again, this is just um, a uh, CDC presentation of the same life cycle, a little bit more color, showing the different tissues of the organs that are infected. And the three different species here, we're focusing on mansoni. There's other species of um, schistosomes that affect different parts of the body. And um, um, the... Um, Successive generations of sporocysts, again, skipping the radial stage is apparent here. <clears throat> and this um, summary slide, which is in your textbook, sorry about that, uh, can show um, the different complicated things that can happen. You can have mother sporocysts and then daughters that are created, again, in a cycling fashion. You can have mother and daughter redia. Um, you can have mother redia uh, straight to cercaria without additional generations. Um, the cercaria can go to metacercaria. In some cases, cercaria goes straight to adults like it does in schistosome. Then there's this mesocercaria. So if, if nothing else, what you can get out of this is how complicated it can be. And the variations on the evolutionary theme of um, trematode reproduction and the challenges that parasites have to have faced, just sort of imagining these complex life cycles evolving um, just shows you how successful it is actually to be a parasite in spite of all of those inhibitions or, or those prohibitions that um, parasites have had to overcome, evolutionarily speaking. So um, both both in impressive and repugnant at, at the same time. Um, 
that sort of ends. This is the, the third part of the Platy Helmets starting in class. Maybe we can think of it as four parts all together, one in class, three online. And I hope you guys have all listened to this, and I will see you in class on Thursday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.